The End of Oz, Chapter 13, Dorothy I have to admit, Bapu's news that my new fiancé was planning on killing me didn't come as a total shock, but still I was miffed. I knew I'd sensed a spark between us, and the idea of ruling our twin kingdoms together wasn't entirely unappealing. I don't like to share, it's true, but I've also never met anyone who came as close to being my equal. Okay, Bapu, I said. What exactly did you hear? Why did the Gnome King go to all this trouble to rescue me if he's only going to kill me? That doesn't make any sense at all. Bapu snuffed a little and dabbed at the corner of her eyes with her sleeve. The shoes, she said miserably. He wants Mistress's shoes. I know that, I said, rolling my eyes. He thinks they're his, the ninny, but he can't have them. They're bound to me. If he kills me, they'll be useless. It occurred to me as I said this that I had no idea if it was true, except in a way I did. If he could get the shoes back just by offing me, I have been dead the minute he, he'd found me, so it was something else. He needed to marry me to get the shoes, but why? Something occurred to me. But Pooh, what's a wedding like in Ev? Your wedding will be the most splendid ever seen in all of Ev, Bapu assured me. Bapu, I don't want to have a wedding if I die at it. Do you understand that part? She nodded vigorously. So, I said patiently, before the Gnome King kills me, what happens exactly at a traditional Ev wedding? Bapu looked thoughtful. Vows? she offered. I reminded myself to be patient. Yes, dear, I understand that, but what do the vows say? What about the ceremony? What else happens? Realization dawned in her eyes. Oh, you want to know about the magic? Yes, Bapu, I said, excitement flooding through my veins. I knew it. There was something about the wedding itself, something important that the Gnome King wanted, something part of the ceremony. Is it something to do with the shoes? Bapu nodded eagerly. Yes, the shoes. They are bound to you, mistress. I know that, Bapu. I said through gritted teeth, but the Gnome King doesn't want me to use them. Do you know why? He wants their magic back? I need to know why he wants to kill me, I shrieked, unable to control myself any longer. Oh, Bapu said, you should have said that to begin with, mistress. The shoes are bound to you, but Ev's wedding vows are magical. All magic is shared between the spouses. So I can siphon off the Gnome King's magic? I asked. That didn't make sense at all. Why would he risk making himself vulnerable? But Pooh was already shaking her head. That's not his plan, mistress. He doesn't like to share anything. Magic can be stolen once it is bound. With blood. It took me a second for her words to sink in. With blood? She nodded, her lower lip quivering. The king will bind his magic to yours, and then use your blood to seal it. All of it. That's why he will try to kill you. A wedding followed by the traditional bloodletting reception. And I'd had my heart set on a multi-tiered wedding cake. She puffed out her chest a little. But I will protect you. In spite of myself, I smiled. I'm sure that will be very helpful, I said. She beamed. Hmm, I said, thinking out loud. That's awfully nasty magic, really. But that's not a huge surprise, either. Ev seems to be fairly a fairly nasty place. All this slavery and cave-dwelling in bad fashion? Bapu nodded. Very nasty. You will take me back to Oz when you defeat the Gnome King, won't you? I could help you there, too. And there it was. My little seed of friendship had grown into a full bloom. The little creature wasn't quite as stupid as she looked, and her motives weren't entirely altruistic. Her eyes were wide and pleading, but I caught a spark of cunning, too. I wasn't angry, I was pleased. At least there was something in this sad, shabby munchkin. Is that why you're helping me, Bapu? I asked sweetly. No, she said hastily. I raised an eyebrow. Maybe a little, she admitted. You have nothing to be ashamed of, I told her. Helping yourself is the most important thing of all. Unless you work for me, in which case it's helping me, but I think I can make this work out for both of us. And yes, Bapu, I'll bring you back to Oz. So I can help you there? 
she brightened. I'll tell you what, I said. If, when, we both make it back to Oz in one piece, I'll set you free. She stared at me with her mouth hanging open. Free? she whispered. Free? Her eyes filled with tears. It was a word that she clearly hadn't let herself even dream of in a long time. I put, I put out my hand. A moment later, she took it, gazing up at me in bewilderment. We're shaking on it, I explained, gravely shaking her wrinkly hand. It's a deal. A deal, she echoed. And then she squared off her shoulders and stood tall and proud. If you help me escape, I will lay down my life for you, Dorothy Gale, she said. And do you know what? I was almost moved. Ev was making me soft. But I couldn't help it. I knew what it was like to be stuck in an awful place with no hope or ever getting free again, and I knew how much worse it was when you knew how beautiful the alternative could be. When I'd been stuck in Kansas a second time with no way back to Oz, well, it didn't bear, I, it didn't bear thinking about, but I knew exactly what Papu was going through. I'd been tortured in Kansas, too. I'd suffered terrible pr privation. I'd weep into my pillow every night, desperate to regain what I'd lost. Okay, so maybe I wasn't literal torture, but the mind is the most sensitive organ. What I've gone through in Kansas was just as bad as whipping and imprisonment. I clapped my hands and Bapu jumped. Let's get down to business, I said. If I'm going to thwart my own mor murder and get us out of here, I need to come up with a plan. I thought for a while. I couldn't deny that I was intrigued by the Gnome King, even now that I knew he wanted to kill me. He just wanted his power back and that much I can understand. It wasn't his fault. I stood in his way, although I was a little miffed he hadn't even asked me to share. I was clever, rich, and beautiful. What ruler wouldn't want me at his side? But the Gnome King was ancient. It was no wonder his power had run down dark and ugly paths in the centuries he'd been holed up underground, hating the outside world. And from the look of things, he and I had very different approaches to the way we cared for our kingdoms. Queendoms. Whatever. I knew a few malcontents I've had complaints about the way I did things in Oz, but I've only ever wanted for my subjects to be happy. I'd never have enslaved any of them if they would only do what they were told. Plus, when they were miserable, I'd order them to follow the happiness decree, and when that failed to cheer them up, I'd insisted on perma-smile. Aunt Em always used to say that no one could stay under the weather as long as they had smiles on their faces. I would never let my subjects suffer the way the Gnome King did. Why, he didn't even insist they look happy when he was around them. I mulled over what to do next as Bafu brushed out my hair. I didn't want to die, obviously. Who would? But I couldn't let go of the idea that the Gnome King was missing out. On me. We were two of the most powerful people in the world, whichever world you picked. We balanced each other out perfectly. He was grumpy mean and lived in a cave and I was beautiful and all my subjects loved me or else together the two of us would make a formidable team to be honest I've never been one of those girls who'd fantasized about my wedding but now that the possibility was in front of me I was starting to have ideas a whole entire day that was basically a holiday for me a party where I was the star, an event that involved hundreds of people coming from all over the world to bring me presents and tell me how beautiful I looked? Who could possibly resist? And realistically, the Nun King was the most eligible bachelor I was luckily to run across in Oz or Ev. There was about a million single powerful witches running around, but the last gentleman caller I'd had was Tin. Ugh. No, I was simply going to have to convince the Gnome King that I was more used to him alive than dead. I'd have to use every ounce of power I had to charm his pants off. Figuratively speaking, I would never sacrifice my precious chastity before marriage, of course. In short, I'd have to make him fall in love with me. And if that didn't work, I had to kill him first. I certainly had my work cut out for me. Considering I was a girl locked in a room, I was going to have to take care of that right away. I wiggled my toes experimentally and felt the shoes stir to life. I had one small advantage. The Gnome King might have realized I could use magic again, but I was pretty sure he hadn't seen that awful idiot Amy the way I did. I was never going to forgive her for stealing my other shoes. Those were mine, and the little bitch had no right to them. 
but whatever she'd used them for, it was through her channeling their power that mine had been awakened. So in a way, I owed her a favor. Technically. Not that I'd ever tell her. And if she was an Ev, it was for one or two reasons. She wanted to kill the Gnome King, or she wanted to kill me. I need a plan. I frowned and chewed on the one knuckle thoughtfully. But Pooh, where will the Gnome King hold our nuptials, do you think? Hmm. Bapu talked her head back and forth, considering. There's the Major Hall. It's not been used in many years, but it is a powerful place. Also vi big. She gestured toward the ceiling with her the hairbrush. Very big. Powerful? Old magic. Very dangerous. She shivered. Diggers, she said. Diggers used to sacrifice people there. That'll be the place, then, I said cheerfully. Good work, Bapu. How many entrances does it have? Only one, mistress. Well, I'd just better be sure I kill him, then, if I couldn't make him fall in love with me. A single exit from what was I was sure. I was sure going to be a very well-guarded event. Even at the height of my powers, that would have made for a tricky escape. And while my shoes seemed to be walking up again, waking up again, or whatever it was they were doing, I could tell my magic was still hard to access this far from Oz. It made sense that the shoes would work here, if they'd really come from the Gnome King somehow, and it made sense too that my own magic would work best in Oz. But if I could practice with my shoes, maybe I could find a way to amplify my power. Except that based on what happened at that sad excuse for a banquet, the Gnome King could tell if I used them. But there was another weapon I could use against him if I had to. Amy Gum. I sighed heavily. And right on cue, the door opened. Oh, hello, darling, I cooed, jumping to my feet. Thanks to Pooh's efforts, my hair spilled around my shoulders in glossy waves, and I was still wearing the dress I'd put on for the Gnome King's banquet. It wasn't my best look by a long shot, but I'm an enterprising girl. The Gnome King did not look thrilled at the sight of me. Don't think you can fool me, Dorothy, he growled. All pretense of the dashing suitor was gone. His tone was threatening. I widened my eyes and looked at him prettily through my lashes. I'd be wasting my time playing dumb at this point, but I could still take him by surprise. You need me, I purred, so be a little nicer. To my satisfaction, he actually looked taken aback, and then he laughed. You're a prisoner in my kingdom who couldn't use magic until an hour ago, he said, and I'm guessing you're not up to full strength quite yet. I hardly think I need you. I'm your guest, not your prisoner. Be respectful when you address me, I snapped. I'm not some dimwit glitterball like Glinda. You don't have any idea who it is you're trifling with. I can make you regret the day you were born, you doddering old coot. His face contorted into a frown. Well, that got his attention. I'm not trying to trick you, I added with dignity. Believe me, I have no idea what happened back there. That was the truth, and I made sure to look him in the eye when I said it. And I have an idea how, or if, I could make anything like that happen again. So, that was maybe the teeniest fib. I knew my magic was back. I just didn't know what to what extent, or if I could even harness it fully. So it let my little white lie that gloss of truth. He looked closely at my face and then seemed satisfied. When we are married, my darling, there will never be any secrets between us, I promised, batting my eyelashes again. Other than the fact that you want to kill me, I thought. But really, over my dead body, I'd find a way to stop him, come hell or high water. Of course not, he said smoothly. His smile was bland and pleasant now. He knows I'm lying, I thought. He just doesn't know about what. I moved quickly to distract him. Darling, perhaps you'll allow me to make a few suggestions about the wedding, I purred again, looping my arm around his. Might I see the venue and the rest of your palace? I've barely set foot outside this lovely rooms since you brought me here. I refrained from adding that was because he locked me in them. He cocked his head at me. I knew he was trying to figure out what I was up to, but apparently he decided that there was no harm in showing me around a little. As you wish, he said gravely, bowing like a perfect gentleman and opening the door for me. I gave Papua a wink over his shoulder and nodded fiercely. 
First I will show you the palace, and then the cavern where our wedding will take place. Well, the grand tour was a grand disappointment. Just a bunch of miserable old caverns and dusty tapestries and creepy staircases that went nowhere.